Uh, we welcome you all once again to our uh, Tuesday Zoom meeting. And today's uh, topic is discipline of the mind. In fact, uh, this week, uh, uh, today, Thursday, and on Sunday night, it's going to be the uh, theme of discipline. Today will be discipline of the mind, on Thursday, discipline of the body. And uh, on uh, Sunday, it will be discipline to accept discipline. So today we're going to focus on the important aspect of our thinking, our minds. So Christians generally neglect the role of the mind in Christian life. We are very careful about uh, how we live because people can see it. We are careful about what we speak because people can hear what we speak. We are not very careful about uh, what we think. Yet our thinking will decide how we live and what we speak. And in the letter of Paul to the Romans, which is a basis for a theme verse for tonight, in Romans chapter 8, verse 5 and 6, Paul writes, Do they live according to sinful nature? Have their minds set on what na that nature desires? Do they live in accordance with the Spirit? Have their minds set on what the Spirit desires? The mind of sinful man is death. Death meaning separation. The mind is always on the things of the sinful nature, then we, we can't have fellowship with God, cut off from God for that period till we return back. But the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. And remember, please, that this letter was written to Christians, Christians living in Rome. So Christians' mind can be under the authority of the sinful nature or under the control of the spirit. It's up to the Christian to decide on what his mind is going, is going to be stayed on, what his mind is going to be thinking on. And here very clearly, Paul writes, if you live a sinful nature, you'll be cut off from God for that period, as long as you return back to God, till you return back to God. If you look according to the spirit, mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. Now, in the eighth verse of the same uh, chapter, Paul writes, those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. Cannot please God. Now, all of us as believers, we all want to please God. We may not always please God, but I'm sure all of us would love to please God. If you want to please God, a mind should not be controlled by the sinful nature but rather by the Holy Spirit. Now, the sinful nature is in every human being. And it is basically in the senses of the body. Uh, eyes, our ears, what we speak, the five senses we have. Those five senses of the body tend to get attracted by the temptations in this world. A body reacts to things of this world. A sinful nature resides in the members of our flesh, parts of our body. And when we turn to Christ, what happens is our spirits come alive. Earlier, our spirits were cut off from God. But as we receive Christ into our hearts, our spirits come alive, meaning we can have a relationship with God. At the point of time we accept Jesus, we become God's children. John chapter 1, verse 12. And in Galatians 4, 6, it's written, Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. Because you are sons, God set the spirit of the son into hearts, the spirit of God's or Abba, Father. So now we have Holy Spirit living inside us. So every believer in Christ, genuine believer, has the Holy Spirit living in him or her. Now the question is, he is there to guide us, to teach us, to reveal God to us, are we listening to him or are we influenced by the sinful nature? Now, the sinful nature tends to make us think about many things. For example, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus how they were living before they turned to Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 from verse 1. As for you, you are dead you are dead, mean cut off from God, in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you follow the ways of the world. 
and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. At one time, you are following the world, you are following the evil one. And then he goes on to say in verse 3, all of us lived among them at one time, the sinful nature. And since he lived among them, gratifying the cravings of the sinful nature, cravings of the sinful nature, the body, following its desires and thoughts, its desires. Which desire? Desires of the sinful nature. At one time, before you turn to Christ, you're following the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. You are cut off from God. You are dead. Dead means separated. And he goes on to say about himself, all of us also lived among them at one time. Gratifying the cravings of the sinful nature. We had the sinful nature, we had cravings, we gratified it. We yielded to it. And then he goes on to say, following his desires and thoughts. Thoughts of the sinful nature. That's a problem. When the thoughts come, we tend to live by those thoughts, have those thoughts in our mind. And the thoughts in the mind affect the spirit, the human spirit, not God's spirit. Every Christian has the body, the mind, his or her own spirit, and the Holy Spirit. And our spirits get contaminated by persistent thinking of the thoughts of the sinful nature. That's why in the Old Testament, in Hebrews 4.14, the Lord told the Israelites, people living in Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, wash the sin from your heart and be saved. How long will you harbor wicked thoughts? So at one time we were following those wicked thoughts, thoughts of the sinful nature. But then in Romans 13, 14, Paul writes, Romans 13, 14, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Don't even think about it. Yes, you have desires of sinful nature and you tend to gratify it in the olden days before you became a believer. Now, don't even think about it. The word, uh, I'm, the verse, verse I'm quoting in Romans 13, 14, I'm quoting from the NIV version, like I usually do. But sometimes I quote from the King James version when it's more accurate. And to more understand, for more understanding, the King James version says, "Put thee on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust thereof. Make no provision for the flesh. Flesh meaning sinful nature, which resides in the flesh. The word provision." Is from a Greek word called pronoia. Pronoia means forethought. Don't even have a forethought of sin. Don't have a blink of it. The moment it comes, throw it away. We throw away those thoughts. It's up to us to allow our minds to be controlled by the sinful nature or by the spirit. Now, as compared to what we should not be doing, what we should be doing is Galatians 5.16. Paul writes, so I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. We have the sinful nature living in us. Till the day we die, we'll have the body. When you leave the body, that's death. A uh, world cause that we, go, we fall asleep in Christ. Sinful nature will be. But by the Holy Spirit's power, we put to death the mysteries of the body. We look at Romans chapter 18, sorry, Romans chapter 8, verse 13. Romans 8, 13. The Apostle Paul writes, If you live according to sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit, by the Spirit, you put to death, you put to death the mysteries of your body, you will live. You will live means you will grow. Life means growth. You grow in the Lord. And then, in Galatians 5.24, Paul writes, Galatians 5.24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with his passions and desires. So by the Holy Spirit's anointing and power and his wisdom he gives us, we put to death the mysteries of our body. And for that, we must let our minds be controlled by the Spirit, which is life and peace. Life means growth, 
and then there has life grows you stop growing you die life basically means growth in biology what does life mean growth so when you, and our minds are controlled by the spirit we grow in the lord we grow in your new birth we are born again when we accept christ and we have to grow in the new birth in the new life we have a new life to grow in that new life we must let our minds be controlled by the spirit and this life is life and peace 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 means oneness oneness with god we preserve our peace as we walk in step with the spirit and we grow in the new life god has given us mark these two words for life and peace let's go back to the old testament in the old testament we read about when the israelites were chosen by god to be given the commandments they were set apart from the other nations to be given the commandments they were holy nation holy means set apart and god's plan was as this holy nation would obey the commandments all the other nations will come to know who the true god is and thereby they also become holy set apart holy means set apart set apart from following the world to following the true living god so the nation of israel was set apart from other nations to be an example to the rest of the world and a, a, a give a revelation of who the true god is through their obedience to god that's what before the commandments were given the lord sent moses down to the israelites in the plains of mount sinai with a message exodus 19 chapter 4 5 you yourself know what i did to egypt and how i carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession although the whole earth is mine you'll be for me a kingdom of priests you'll be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation so the nation of israel was supposed to be priest for the remaining nations that was god's plan and they failed god and within the israelites in the holy nation god chose a few people to be priests for the remaining people the tribe of levi in the book of deuteronomy chapter 10 8 and 9 we read at that time the lord set apart the tribe of levi for three things to be priest of course to carry the ark of the covenant to minister before the lord and to pronounce blessings on the people three things the function of the levites and levi and his descendants with this to carry the ark of the covenant ark of the covenant signifies the presence of god god's presence in the old testament time also to minister before god to minister to god on behalf of people they were chosen set apart mark the term set apart holy nation of israel holy from other nations within the nation of israel levites set apart to minister before god carry the ark of the covenant and pronounce blessings upon the people set apart now the setting apart also was in the context of focusing on the things of god that is why god did not give them land in the land of canaan deuteronomy 10 chapter 8 and 9 is about the, the calling the levites and the 10th verse talks about that's why they have not given physical land no inheritance from them no inheritance god says i will be their inheritance land will be divided into 12 parts the 12th part which is supposed to be a levi one of sons of israel will go to sons of joseph ephraim and manasseh the levites will have no inheritance or possession in the land why they were required to focus on the lord and the lord himself was to be their inheritance that's the calling for the levites and then the lord told them i'm not giving you land i'm your inheritance then you find in malachi chapter 2 5 to 7 Malachi two five to seven. 
the Lord speaks about an exclusive covenant he made with Levi. No physical land for you, Levi, and your descendants. You missed up before me. Those days carry the Ark of the Covenant. Pronounce blessings upon the people. That's a function for you. I have to focus on that. Set apart, even in your thinking, keeping in mind the call of God. Now, although God did not give them physical land, God made a very special, exclusive covenant with the Levi. Malachi 2, 5 to 7. Lord says, my covenant with them was a covenant of life and peace. Covenant of life and peace. The ring a bell, which I shared earlier, life and peace. For us, spirit and controls of mind, life and peace. For the Levites, he says, I made a covenant with them, covenant of life and peace. And I gave them to him, life and peace. This call for reverence. He revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth. Nothing false was found upon his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many from sin. For the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge and from his mouth men should seek instruction because he is a messenger of the Lord Almighty. What an amazing covenant. You rever me, walk with me, I'm giving you life and peace. Today, in the New Testament, we Christians are priests. Every one of us is a priest. In fact, we are a royal priest to the holy nation. First Peter chapter 2, 9 and 10. And therefore, all those attributes that God gave to Levi are also for us. We are supposed to minister before the Lord, worship him, praise him, have relationship with him, be at peace with him. We have, in fact, Ark of the Covenant means what presence of God. And God's presence is inside us. He lives in us. We don't carry the Ark today. We carry Him. Wherever we go, He goes. Because our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. The Ark of the Covenant made of acacia wood those days symbolized God's presence. Today, He lives inside us. And we are supposed to minister before the Lord, just like the Levites. And we are supposed to pronounce blessings on the people. The same mouth that praises God cannot curse people. Opposite of cursing is blessing. Look at the third chapter of James, 1, 1 to 11. talks about from the same mouth cannot come cursing people and blessing God, or, or worshipping God. You worship God. Same mouth can't curse people. We are supposed to bless people. So the instruction in the New Testament to all believers, Ephesians chapter 4, 29, 30, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. But only what is useful for building up others according to the needs that may benefit those who listen. Whatever we speak should benefit people, bless people, pronounce blessings on people. Same calling as Levi. Minister before God. We carry his presence. Bless people. And for that to happen, our minds must be on the things of God. Our hearts and minds both must be on things of God. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, 2, 3, Paul writes, Colossians chapter 3 was 1, 2, 3. Since you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above. For Christ is the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died. Died dead to the world. Earlier they were dead to God. You are in sin. Now you're dead to sin, alive to God. You are dead. And life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is alive, appears, will appear within the glory. Set your minds on things above, set your hearts on things above. Which means, we must let our minds be controlled by the Holy Spirit, who speaks to us, who blesses us with the word of God. Now, as I told you, we are called to be God-pleasers. 
Now we please God in our words, I suppose, in our lives, I suppose. What about our thinking? He knows our thoughts. In Psalm 94 verse 11 we read, Psalm 94 verse 11, God knows the thoughts of man. He knows they are futile. Our thoughts are usually futile. It is apart from God. And amazingly, while our thoughts are futile and they think of wrong things, Amos 4.13 says about God, He reveals His thoughts to man. Old Testament time. He reveals His thoughts to man. Can you imagine what an amazing statement that is? Especially today as God's people, we have access to God's thoughts. That's why the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2.16, we have the mind of Christ. What an awesome possibility for you and me. Paul says, we have the mind of Christ. That's because his, Paul's mind was totally on the things of God, heart and mind. He had access to the thoughts of God. That's so what's very encouraging for you and me. To the church in Philippi, he writes, Philippians chapter 2 verse 5, Philippians 2nd chapter verse 5, I'm quoting from the King James Version again. Let this mind be in you, which is in Christ Jesus. Let this mind be in you. So while we have all kinds of thoughts floating around in our minds, let's understand God knows the, our thoughts. Old Testament time, Isaiah 55, 7. God says, let the wicked forsake his ways and the evil man his thoughts. So if you are a God please, if you are God pleasers, we will consciously let the minds be controlled by the Spirit of God, not by the sinful nature. And the Holy Spirit will always take the word and bring to us, and we are supposed to take the word very, very seriously, not only in our hearts, also in our minds. Today we have this awesome privilege of God Himself writing His word in our hearts and minds. Jeremiah 31, 33, where the prophecy was given to Jeremiah and fulfilled in the New Testament, confirmed in Hebrews 8, 10, how today God writes his word in our hearts and minds. So now as we are living in the wicked world, there are all kinds of thoughts coming to us. People say many things, we hear many things, and our minds are bombarded by all kinds of thoughts. We hear gossip. We hear slander. Even from Christians, we hear that. And we should take authority over those thoughts. Don't let those thoughts occupy their mind. Discipline means training, instruction. We train our minds not to have in mind those things. They'll come. Put it away. That's why God has given us a weapon. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, 3, 4, 5. Though we live in this world, we don't wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the other hand, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets is the love of the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Jesus. Now, while we are living in a world, while we hear from people say many things, I told you gossip, slander, uh, all kinds of things we hear, lies we hear, false allegations we hear, don't let it occupy your mind. You hear? Let's put it away. Take authority over that. It's not from God. God does not want us to keep our minds on those things. On the other hand, He wants our hearts and minds to be on the things of God. Not just not on the devil's thoughts, but on the things of men we should not have. Remember the time when Peter told Jesus, after the Lord told the disciples about he's going to go to Jerusalem, be arrested, he'll be crucified, and he'll be risen from the dead, he told them. And Peter tells them, Matthew 16, 22, Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. And the Lord rebukes Peter. He says, get behind me, Satan. Verse 23. You are a stumbling block to me. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. 
things of God, things of men are very different. Usually man's talk is worldly. Whereas Holy Spirit gives us only God's word. So there could be things of God, things of men, also sometimes things of the devil. And devil can use men to give us his thoughts. What Peter told Jesus was, never Lord, this shall never happen. It's a very human response. The Lord said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to arrest him, I'm going to get killed. He said, don't go, don't go. Shouldn't happen to you. A human response. In fact, some people think very compassionate he was. Among all the disciples, he's the only one who said, don't go. Others, they're keeping quiet. But the source of the thought, origin was from the devil. That's why Jesus tells him, get behind me, Satan. He's telling Peter, you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Sometimes we think things of men are holy, worldly, it's human, it's okay. But when people talk gossip and slander and all kinds of things which are ungodly, don't take it to mind. From the mind goes into the heart. It will contaminate the heart. On the other hand, we are called to be a people who will keep our minds upon the things of God. Even the Old Testament, it says, Isaiah writes, Isaiah 26.3, You keep in perfect peace him whose mind is stayed upon thee. When our minds are upon the Lord and the things of God, we preserve the peace God has given us. In the Old Testament time, peace was conditional to obedience. Today, peace has been given to us already freely through Christ and we preserve that peace through obedience. Obedience not to also in our thinking. Now, all of us want to, obviously, as Christians, we want to follow Jesus. We want to imitate his life. There's a calling for every one of us. We are called to be holy, set apart after receiving salvation. 2 Timothy 1.9 He saved us, called us to holy life. If we want to imitate the life of Jesus, we must think like Jesus. Old Testament says, again, King James Version, Proverbs 23.7 as a man thinks, so is he. As a man thinks, so is he. If you want to be like Jesus, you should think like Jesus. And always have in mind the things of God. In John 4, 34, Jesus says to his disciples, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and finish his work. That's my food. To do the will of him who sent me and finish his work. That's the key for all of us. God reveal his will to us. General will you keep doing. In that process you can discern God's specific will. And be focused on that. We must discipline our minds not to get distracted from the calling God has for us. Discipline is training. We are soldiers for Christ. How wonderful to know that. Soldiers means what? Discipline. Soldiers means punctuality. Soldiers means early morning getting up. Soldiers means early morning exercise. Hard work. Hard work. So we are soldiers for Christ. We have to be disciplined. Any soldier in any, any army anywhere in the world is a common qualities. Punctuality, early morning getting up, discipline, Submission to authority, no laziness, we have to be ready at all times, all times, be ready to do what you are supposed to do. And therefore, we have to discipline our minds to have in mind the things of God and take God's word very, very seriously. Don't take it lightly. You know, uh, last month, end of last month, one of our very close uh, uh, fellowship members, also a board member of Logos Ministries, went to be with the Lord, very close to me, as my like elder brother. And uh, we had a memorial service uh, beginning of this month. I had the privilege of sharing uh, the message on, on that day, memorial service. And this gentleman had a wonderful habit of noting down whatever he heard from God. His own personal Bible study, our Bible studies here, wherever he is, you have a notebook, write down. 
And also when he used to have prayer meetings, when God spoke through prophecy, he would note down that also. Now on, uh, when I spoke in memorial service, I spoke about uh, how in 2 Peter 1, God gave me that verse, how he would receive a rich welcome into heaven. 2 Peter 1.11, a rich welcome into heaven. He would receive it. I told the, the meeting. Today I got a message from his wife, very prayerful lady. Today I got a message in the morning that how she was going through the notes of his notebook. And 2010, God gave me a prophecy, gave me a word to share with him, a prophecy. 2010, 11 years back, when the Lord told him, when you leave this world, you'll receive a rich welcome into heaven. 2010, he wrote down the no notebook, diary. Today she saw it in the diary. She sent me a message, text message. Brother, I'm so thankful. 2010, God spoke through you to my husband. He'll receive a rich welcome into heaven. 11 years later, as a memorial service, the same verse I'm sharing. I never knew. I, I forgot about it. I mean, I can't remember all this, uh, whatever God speaks. What God speaks to me, I have to take to heart. I said, because this man had the wonderful habit of taking to heart everything God spoke. Now, today, after he's gone to be with the Lord, his wife looks at the diary, and how much you encourage today, how the assurance, indeed, 11 years back, God spoke, he'll have rich welcome into heaven. Like Stephen, when he was being stoned to death, he saw heaven open, Jesus standing at God's right hand. Standing reception, standing ovation. What I'm trying to say here is, take God's word very, very seriously. You will never know what God will speak on a particular day. Sometimes we think of, you know, today's message is going to be an interesting topic, I'll listen. Some other day, that's not an interesting topic for me, I may not listen. If you have time, if you're, if you're set apart for this, and God puts in a heart to listen, you will never know what God will speak. I remember when I was sharing in, in Siberia in 1991, in a meeting with some uh, Russian leaders, God reminded me of what I learned 15 years earlier in my personal Bible study. That I had forgotten. He reminded me. And therefore, God wants us to take to heart, literally take to heart, and to the mind, whatever God speaks. And thereafter, keep in mind the things of God. Don't let it pass by. Don't let the devil steal what God put in your heart. From the heart, it must come to the mind, mind to the heart. Both, both ways it works. Because when you sleep at night, the heart will instruct you. In Psalm 16, 7 and 8, the psalmist says, Psalm 16, verse 7 and 8, I praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. At night, my heart instructs. It comes to the mind. In the sleep will find itself quoting Bible verses. When you get a nightmare in the night, if you spend your whole life with the Lord, life of prayer, not prayer life. People ask, how's your prayer life? <laughs> they ask sometimes. It's not a prayer life. It's a life of prayer. Always be in communion with God. So as we do that, ministry, our life becomes an outflow of the relationship with God. And in that process, our minds get bombarded by all kinds of thoughts from people, like I said, gossip, slander, false allegation, pulling you down, uh, discouraging you, in instilling fearful thoughts in the mind. Dismiss that. Discipline your mind. Rebuke the evil one in Jesus' name. Who uses people to bring these thoughts? Many kinds of thought process the devil brings. Very often I share about that. Sinful thoughts, anxious thoughts, discouraging thoughts, discouraging thoughts, futile thoughts, wasteful thoughts, worldly thoughts about money and about things of this world, and bitter thoughts, thoughts of people's sins against us, which leads to bitterness and sometimes even to hatred. All the thought process put away. One more, guilty thoughts, thoughts that lead you to be guilty. All this put away. Don't let them occupy your mind. We are to remember only what God spoke to us and what God did to us. Psalm 103 verse 2 says, Forget not his benefits. Bless the Lord, O my soul. First, one, first and second verse. Bless the Lord, O my soul. 
let my most being praise his holy name, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. Now, the word blessing here means praising, to speak well of. To bless God is to speak well of God. To praise him, worship him, and forget not his benefits. Keep in mind the things God spoke to you and what God did to you. What God did to you, remember. What God spoke to you, remember. Like Mr. Karnakran used to write down in his book. I've seen his book. Sometimes when he comes, I have Friday prayer meeting, he'll come with the book and say, Brother, this, was, this prophecy came three years ago. This is fulfilled today. How wonderful to hear that. You take the word very, very seriously. Take to heart and the mind, whatever God speaks, and value, cherish God's word. Remember what God did to you in the past? Revelation chapter 3, verse 3, to the church in Sardis, the Lord wrote, the Lord, Lord said, Revelation 3, 3, remember what you received and heard. Obey it and repent. Obey it and repent. I'm so glad there are so many young people in our uh, Zoom. I'm just thrilled by children, young children, asking questions. Sometimes I find nine or ten-year-olds asking questions. So wonderful to know at the tender age, you have a heart for God. And you can be sure God definitely speaks to people who are like children. Not just an age. Have an attitude like a child before God. Because God loves to reveal mysteries to children. Remember the time when Jesus Christ, our Lord, was full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said to the Father, after 70 disciples came back after driving out demons, he, tell, he, he says uh, there about how the Lord tells him, don't rejoice because demons submit to you. Rejoice the names are in the book of life. And Luke 10, 21 says, at that time, Jesus, full of joy in the Holy Spirit, says to the Father, I thank you, Father, God of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed to children, for this was your good pleasure. God finds pleasure in revealing mysteries to children. Children meaning anybody who is teachable, humble, moldable, and having a heart and mind for God. He will reveal mysteries. How wonderful to know there are so many promises God has given us, commandments God has given us. There's joy in obeying him, joy in living for him. Take his word very, very seriously. Because he said, Matthew 24, 35, heaven earth will pass away. My word will never pass away. What remains forever is God's word. And we will also remain with him forever. So both his word and us remain together with him forever. He is there forever always. He will never change. So here is a, let's be a people who live God's word. Let God's word become flesh in us. We are supposed to live by the word. Earlier we were dead to God, alive to the world. Now we are dead to the world and alive to God. In, in Galatians 6, 14, Paul writes, May I never boast except at the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ. Through which the world is crucified, the men have been crucified to the world. I know all of us have so many thoughts bombarding us. The good news is we've been given authority over those thoughts according to 2 Corinthians 10 5. Rebook the devil in Jesus' name and ask the Holy Spirit to write his scriptures in your heart and mind. And once he speaks, please preserve the word in your heart and mind. In Colossians 3, 16, Paul writes, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. Let's God, let God's word dwell in you richly. He wants to write his word. Are we willing to listen? Do we take time to work hard and receive? We have a part to play also. We have to work hard to receive the word. There was a point of time when the Lord Jesus Christ fed more than 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish. They're all following him for food, for bread and fish. They're following him. He tells them in John chapter 6, verse 27, 
do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. Don't work for that food, for your things of this world, working very hard to make money and enjoy life. That's, that's the physical enjoyment. Nothing wrong with that, but don't mind should not be fixed on that. He says, work for food that endures to eternal life, which means we have to work hard for that. When God wakes up in the morning, spend time with him, discipline your body. I'll talk about that on Thursday, discipline your body. But our minds have to be disciplined. Don't let unwanted thoughts occupy the mind. These thoughts come to everybody. We shouldn't let those thoughts occupy our minds. What happens then is, from the mind, the thoughts will go into our spirits and contaminate our spirits. That's why God told the Israelites, living in Jerusalem, Jeremiah 4.14, O Jerusalem, wash the sin from your heart and be saved. How long will you harbor wicked thoughts? How long? You're harboring, keeping in mind. Harboring means what? When a ship comes to a port, Cochin, port or Chennai or Bombay, whatever, ship will come, some ships pass by. Some ship, ships drop anchor. They drop anchor, they stay there. So the question is, when the wrong thoughts come, do you let the thoughts pass by? Or do we let it drop anchor in our minds? What should drop anchor in our minds are the thoughts that the Holy Spirit gives us. Mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. Let not our minds be controlled by the sinful nature. We cannot please God. Impossible to please God. And the Holy Spirit will never leave us. He lives in us. He will strive with us. He will keep on speaking to us. If we forget also, He will remind us. I'm not so disciplined like Brother Karnakran was, writing down everything that God spoke, but I trust in God to remind me when I forget. He reminds me always. Praise God for that. But sometimes I do write down certain things. He's so faithful to remind me. So, whether you, God reminds you or you have a notebook, please take to heart whatever God speaks. I know many people tell me, oh, brother, in the meeting yesterday, God spoke to me. After one week, I asked about God spoke, they don't know. Because they, they let it pass. Don't let it pass. Because when our minds are filled with the word of God, it's cleansed. John 15, 3, Jesus says, you're already clean because the word has spoken to you. When the word occupies a heart and mind, both will be clean. Because the word of God sanctifies us. So discipline your mind to focus on God's word, the things of God, what God did, what God spoke, and completely cut out whatever is not beneficial for a Christian life. May God bless us. I'm going to pray for all of us for discipline in our minds. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for each one of us, Lord. I thank you, Master, that you give us authority over our thoughts. you already given us, Lord. Give us wisdom to use authority, Lord, to ensure our minds are cleansed by our word, cleansed by the Spirit. Our hearts are cleansed by our blood, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I pray we'll have a discipline, Lord, to uh, remember that you know our thoughts. And Lord, even though people don't know our thoughts, you know our thoughts. Help our mind always be upon you, Lord. Heart and mind on you, Lord. That we live victorious life, lives. We want to give you all glory, honor, and praise. And help us be people, Lord, who minister unto you, Lord, who know you live in us, Lord, and pronounce blessings upon people, Lord. Speak wholesome talk, not unwholesome talk. We give you glory honor and praise, and thank you for making us priests of God Most High. In Jesus' precious and matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you.